Today you are here because God has made you holy and that you don't have holiness, I don't have holiness, but that Jesus came and he made us holy. And so we are going to look at the, an ancient story about King David and how he consecrated himself to the Lord and how he brought the ark back to Israel and how a poor guy by the name of Uzzah got killed because he did not follow the regulation of the Lord. All right, let us pray and we will ask God to bless this time. And Father, we ask once again for your Holy Spirit to enlighten every mind and to cause us, Lord, to be able to receive the Word of God. Help us, Lord, to comprehend and digest this Word that we might apply uh, this Word into our life and into our situation. And help us, Lord, to always honor you. For in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So the power of consecration. Now David was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned for four years. So you know that he was a young man, uh, but when he got a call of God, he was 15 years old. So imagine at 15 years old, and he got to wait for another 15 years. Now this is something that many of us do not understand. That when we got a call of God, God may not fulfill that call immediately because God is going to send you to a time of preparation. Some of you are called by God to be pastors and you have been waiting and say, when I'm going to be pastor? And some of you have been called to be evangelists and you are called to be witnesses and you are called to be many things in the kingdom of God. But yet you find there's no fulfillment because God is putting you into the training school. And therefore for David, he had to wait 15 years and not becoming the king of Israel, but just the king of Judah. All right. So you see in Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years. So he was 30 years old. He reigned for seven years. He became 37 years old and six months. And then in Jerusalem, he ruled over all Israel. So he was 37 plus years old before he started to rule over all Israel. So you find that Wow, it's a long wait, but David was patient because God had his plan. And so he ruled over uh, Judah 33 years and a total of what? 40 years. So David was anointed to be a king at 15 years old by prophet Samuel. And he only became the king of Judah at 30 years old. And then he reigned for 40 years. He reigned over Judah seven and a half years and he reigned over all Israel uh, and Judah for 33 years. I want to emphasize this is to let you learn how to be patient with the Lord. Oftentimes is that when you ask God for something, you want instant gratification because you have been eating instant noodles too much and then drinking instant coffee. Everything instant, instant, instant. God say, wait. Man, man, tang. He say, wait. And so this is what the Walk in the kingdom of God is all about. You have to learn how to wait. And so what happened was that David was a, a man after God's own heart because the Bible says that after removing Saul, you see Saul was a man driven by his own ambition. So be very careful. If you only have your own ambition, then you find that God will detach himself from your ambition. Because your ambition is not endorsed by God. But when you go into the presence of God and you seek God for confirmation, and then God says, I have an assignment for you. I have this appointment for you that would you submit and would you follow? Then you find that straight away you enter into the plan of God and everything starts to happen. And so that's what David did. He was only a shepherd boy in the back part of the uh, wilderness, you know, where he got to face lions and he got to face bear to take care of his flock. He was a nobody. And if you understand the Jewish culture, shepherds were not really looked after. I mean, they look up to, they were not really looked up to. People look up to magistrate, people look up to businessmen, 
People look up to shop owners. People look up to merchants. People look up to kings. People look up to doctors and so on. But not shepherds. And especially a shepherd boy, he was a nobody. But God said, I'm going to make you a somebody. People don't like shepherd, you know why? Because shepherds smell like sheep. And sheep, they are not so... You know, it's like when you wrap pigs, you also smell like pigs. All right? My uncle used to wrap pigs. And every time I would go to his pig farm, you know, he smelled exactly like the pig. Yeah. Yes. But I love my uncle, yeah? So, but... So, the people out there, they were not, you know, in, in favor of having a shepherd coming into the shop. Because you bring the smell into that shop. But yet, David was special. Because he was not just a shepherd, he was a worshiper. He was a musician. On his own, he was worshiping God. Now, I ask you a question. On your own, do you worship God? Or do you only come to church and you raise your hand? And I worship you by home. Never even raise one finger to worship God because no time. Right? Only got time to click and watch Korean movie. Click and watch Chinese movie. But no time to I worship you. But David was different. David was a man after God's own heart because he was a boy after God's own heart. He was already worshipping. And I pray that you all will learn how to worship God and learn how to love God. And so the Bible says that uh, the Lord said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will carry out my will in his entirety. How do I know if you are a person after God's own heart? The, the answer is, are you carrying out the plan of God in your life in its entirety? If God asks you to turn right, do you turn left? If God asks you to go straight, do you dare to turn? Some of us, we challenge God. We don't care, bo chop, you know. We don't care. God, you say turn right. Well, who cares about you? I turn left. <laughs> then when you fall into the long gang, you say, help. <laughs> right? God said, I told you don't turn left. But I want to see how deep the long gang is. <laughs> this is what happened to many people, right? That when they fall into the ditch, now those of you may not know what Long Kang is, it's a ditch. When they fall into the ditch, then they start to call for God. When do you call? When do you praise God? When do you call help? It's when you are in a ditch. And therefore, you find that sometimes God might want you to call Him all the time because God loves you. God says, Ah, yeah, my daughter is not talking to me. My son is not talking to me. Let him go into the ditch first. Then he will call me, Lord, help me. The only time that he called God is when he is in trouble. And then you say, no wonder I have so much problem in my life. Because you do not know how to call upon God during peace time. Oh, I have learned, I have learned, I have learned a long time ago. When I am peaceful and God is blessing me, I'm praising Him, I'm praising Him. Don't throw me into the long car. I'm praising you. God, you see, I'm connecting with you. But you see, my heart, I long for God. Every morning I got up, I tell you, the first thing I thought of, not my wife, the first thing I thought of, God. The first thing I think about would be God. Why? Because that He has blessed me and I walk with Him all these years. These are almost like uh, 50 years, 50 years of walking with the Lord. And I'm so used to His presence. And so, here a man after God's own heart. And then you find that when God ordained you, when God appoints you, the Bible says, and David became what? More and more powerful. Now, some of you who are in business and some of you who have various kinds of a career, how come you are not powerful in what you are doing? How come you are not achieving things? How come you are not fulfilling the dream that you, that you have? It's because you do not know how to submit to God's plan. Because God's plan is the best. And David, he knew. He became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. And then after capturing a Jerusalem from the Jebusites, yeah, David, he established a new headquarters, a capital. And there, and he called it City of David. Why did he call it City of David? Because that this is the place where he has a new season. This is the place that was the place where he would have a new life. 
And that was the place whereby the Lord will honor David. And then what happened? The Philistine heard, because David became the, the king, right? And so the Philistine said, this young chap here, I'm, we are going to destroy him. So the Bible says the Philistine actually looked for him and wanted to destroy him. And so the Philistine gathered their armies, they attacked. And David did not retaliate first. David did what every spiritual man and woman must do, seek the Lord. He went into the prayer chamber and he sought the Lord and he said, should I attack? Should I fight them? And the Lord said, yes, fight them. I'm with you. I will give you the victory. I want to hear this from God. Before you start any business, before you do anything or take on a new job, seek God's face first. Should I take this job? The prayer should be, Lord, close the door that needs to be closed and open the door that needs to be opened. Should I do this business, Lord? Close the door that needs to be closed and open the door that needs to be opened. That is a show of humility. That is a show of submission. And God responds to people who come in humility. If you are proud, God says, let you go. You do your own things. So you, you, you can tell everybody the Lord is blessing me, but the Lord says, no, I'm not blessing her. I'm not blessing him. Why? Because he's doing his own thing. Oh, he achieved success, of course. But nothing is worse in the world that is to achieve success, the success that God has not intended you to achieve. Means that you are succeeding in the things that God is not asking you. For example, I am a pastor now. If I achieve success as a pastor, great. But if I switch, I say, I don't care about God. I don't want to be a pastor. I want to be a businessman. I want to be a very rich businessman. And I might go out there and make a lot of money. But deep in my heart, I know I am not fulfilling the call of God in my life. But because David, he always asked God. So the second time the Philistine attacked, he asked God again. God said, now I don't want you to attack directly. I want you to go around them. I want you to go around them. And then when you hear the sound, the rusting of the mulberry bushes, means that the wind, you hear the wind, means that you're hiding there and you are going to ambush them. And as you hear the rustling of the wind, you know what happened? It says that, begin your attack. You know why? Because God has sent the angels. The angels will come first. And the angel will attack first. And then you just follow behind. Every time when God sends angels in front of you, I tell you, enemies will fall. Any obstruction will fall. Any mountain up in your way will be moved. Because you trust the Lord. Therefore, I learn, I have learned, and I say, God, thank you. I have learned that I have to submit. I cannot run ahead of God or I cannot run too far away from God. I have to stay close to God. And every time, every day when I talk to God and He said, do this and do that, and I continue to do. I learned from King David. Eventually, all the region in Canaan came under David's control. And so now, David planned to bring back the ark. Did you know the ark was lost? And the ark was in another place? And now David got a capital. He wanted to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. So David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. Now here is one mistake that David did. All right, listen to me very carefully. He did not ask the Lord that he wanted to bring back the ark. He thought that he made this assumption that God would be very happy if he would just bring back the ark. What is the ark? And we shall talk about it uh, further. So, he and all his men went to Baalah, uh, is the Kariat uh, Jerim in Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. Can you see the two, the cherubim? In the center, that's where the 
Shekinah glory of God is. And that glory is like electricity. It's like electricity. You touch it, you die. All right? Even you look at the ark, you die. So this is a very dangerous uh, thing here because God said, I want you to know the glory of God. It's without Jesus Christ, I tell you, you cannot go to heaven because the very moment with your sinful self, you go to heaven, you will be cast down immediately because you cannot take the glory of God. It's like you have been, uh, you know, in the dark room for a very long time and suddenly I just open the window and, or open the door and push you out into the sunlight and suddenly you cannot see because of the blinding light. But those who have been in the light, they will be looking at you and say, why are you doing like that? How come you cannot see? Because you have always been in the dark. Can you see? So the glory of God is like electricity. No matter how old you are, how young you are, you can say, oh Lord, this is my grandson. He is only two years old. Uh, let him touch the electricity, uh, the socket, so that he won't die. How many grandparents would do that? You say, you're crazy. You know that at the very moment, don't care whether you're two years old or 92, you touch the socket, they have life wire, you die, right? So wisdom is needed here. People blame God when their children got accident. Why? Because they didn't take care of their children. Then the children touched electricity and got killed. And they say, God, why you allow it? God is asking you, why you allow it? I give this child to you and you never take care. And now you ask me why I, I should be your uh, uh, nurse or I should be your maid to take care of your baby. Do you see it? We lack a lot of wisdom here. And so you find that when God gave instruction, uh, instruction to Moses, he said that when you build this up, it's going to be very powerful. There will be the glory from heaven, just a portion of it. And he's going to recite in this place called the mercy seat. And so this is what happened here. This is what, in, uh, can you see the glow in the center? That's the mercy seat area. And that in between the cherubim, in between the two angels, the glory of God was there. Then underneath in the box, right, you have the jar of manna. Now that jar of manna is to remind the people of the provision of God. And then you have the Aaron's rod. What is Aaron's rod? Is that rod that budded is to tell you about the priesthood. Is that only this Aaronic priesthood that nobody, nobody would be priest except this from the from that family. But that family, that priesthood now is being handed over to us because now we are the royal priests. We are of the royal priesthood because of Jesus Christ. And so, and then the next one is the stone, uh, the tablets, the commandments. And they were all placed there to tell you about the rules and regulation and the Lord of God. And so this is what this whole Ark of Covenant or Ark of God is all about. But the most important part will be the presence of God, the holiness of God. Therefore, this part of holiness has been missing with many of us. We sometimes treat God like, you know, like nobody. We come to church anyhow we like. If I were to tell you that today uh, or, or tomorrow you have to go and see the Agong, uh, what are you going to do? You are going to wear your shorts and t-shirt, right? And then just go to the palace and say, Hello, Agong. Is that what you're going to do? I think you'll be asking, what is the protocol? What should I wear? Should I wear jacket? Should I wear tie? Should I what? So wear some coat? What, I, what should I wear, right? You are so afraid of a human ruler, but when you come to the ruler of heaven, when you come to the creator God, you are like, I don't care. You see, when I come to church, I dressed up. I'm not saying some of you, some of you are really dressed up if, even when you put one, one tie. Yeah, but get dressed up. Why we say Sunday best is because I'm coming to worship my God. You see, you can worship God at home, and, but that's a different atmosphere. But when you come together with the family, this is the family, then we want to dress up a little bit. Uh, I'm not asking you to dress like, you know, top hat and bow tie and all that. I'm asking you to just 
dress, uh, you know, smart casual, uh, smart casual, right? Like as though you are going to a wedding dinner. Okay, so it's important. Why? Because it depicts the condition of our heart. Our heart says God is not important. It shows how I dress, how I talk, how I behave. Because whatever is in the heart will show in your behavior. Now, how many of you, you have been, uh, you have dated before? The first meeting with your, this new girlfriend or new boyfriend, right? Do you behave or not? Or you just misbehave? Do you brush your teeth or not? You brush maybe five times. Why? Why you want to have a good impression? You want her to have a good impression of, of, of you. you. You want him to have a good impression of you. Can you see that? Because you are concerned about that person. So when I'm concerned about God, I behave. My behavior shows I wear the very best I can wear for Sunday. Look, how did the ark got lost? Got captured. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 2, that at that point, Israel's was attacking and, and was fighting with the Philistine. And so they lost 4,000 men. And there were two very corrupt priests. These two priests, they were the sons of Eli. And these two priests, they brought the ark to the battlefield. They say that, oh, if we bring the ark, then God is obligated to fight for us. And then we will win. So when they brought the ark into the camp, everybody was cheering. Wow, wow, you know. And then the, the Philistine heard them cheering and said, what happened? And then they say, a God has come into their camp. Ooh, I heard about this God. This God destroyed the Egyptian. This God destroyed all the, all the people out there, you know, that were opponents of the people of Israel. Oh, we got to be very careful. And so what the Philistine did was that they did not run. They say, we will fight even better. We are going to demolish them. And that's what they did. So, during the battle, 30,000 Israelites were killed. And at the end, the ark of God was captured. God allowed that. God said, you think that this is a magic box. You think that this is, you know, like uh, the vending machine. You put some coin and then you pull and then all the things will come out. No, 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 it's not a vending machine. And many of us, is because of superstition. We think that, oh, you know, if I go for interview, huh, I bring my Bible, sure get one. My interview, sure pass one. The Bible got magic. All right? And then uh, the, the mother said, oh, tomorrow you ex exam. Uh, I'll put the Bible under your pillow. Then all this knowledge, osmosis will come. You know, God's presence is in the Bible, ma, in the Word of God. So you put under your pillow, it's very good. You see, no, the most, the, 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 the superstitious people are not the Buddhists and all that. They are the Christians. Christians are one of the most superstitious groups, religious groups. They got all kinds of imagination. And so they want to use God, you know. If I do this, then God is obligated. So, uh, you know what? Okay. Tomorrow I'm going for interview, right? This Sunday, I must come to church. I must come to church. All the Sunday, then never come to church. But tomorrow interview, Sunday must come to church. Why? Because I can partake of Holy Communion. Huh? All right? And then I got power. Then I go in interview. Then they see my anointing. And they will hire me. How superstitious are you? Right? And that's exactly what happened. These two corrupt priests, they said, bring the ark and we will win the battle. And God said, watch me. <laughs> God is, a, our, our God is amazing. He's wiser than all of us. And so the ark was captured by the Philistine and the Philistine also, they didn't know the power of God. They captured and they said, whoa, this God is not so powerful. And then maybe we put him in front of our God. Our favorite God is called Dagon. Dagon is a fish God. All right? Dagon is actually known as the father of Baal. How many of you know Baal, Baal, Baal? All right? 
Yeah. So Dagon was supposed to be the father of Baal, means greater than Baal. And then, you know, it is like a mermaid. He got the, the human body on the top, but there's a fish tail that's at, at the end. So, <laughs> they put in the temple of Dagon and say, Dagon, look, we have defeated the God of the Israelites. And next day, Dagon lie flat on the face. Ha, 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 ha. You defeated? God said, I only allow myself to visit you <laughs> and knock you a little bit. And then they put Dagon back again. Oh, you know, so many people put him back again. Next day they came. Ayo, Dagon, you can see the picture. Worse, all parts broken. Hand broken, even the head detached. All right, broken, broken, broken. What God is saying is that this is an idol. His hand, he got hands, he cannot help you. He got head, he cannot help you. Nothing, because I am the creator God. And then something happened in that place called Ashdod. This is a place called Ashdod, right? And then something happened. People began to suffer from tumor and there was rat infestation. Means that rats everywhere. And the people were just having boys. And so they say, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Uh, let's get rid of this God. Let's send it to another place. And they send it to God. All right. What, what is God? God is where the city where Goliath came from. So he sent there. And then the people suffered from tumor in the groin. Oh, that's even worse. You know, in the groin it would be very painful. And then they say, let's send to Akron. When they went to Akron, the people in, in Akron say, you are, you are causing us to suffer. And before they could even say amen, everybody got tumor. And many people died. Because the presence of God, let me tell you, can be a blessing or can be a curse, depend on you. Means that some people, they have God, but because of their disobedience, disobedience generate what? Curses. And so they, they say, oh, I, I put a cross here, ma. I put a poster, say Jesus love you. I put everything, I decorate the, 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 the house are nicer than the church, you know. And how come I'm not blessed? It's your heart. What is in your heart? Do you really believe in God or you are using Him? When I need you, God, I will call you. Meanwhile, stay aside. I feel like coming to church, I'll come to church. If I don't feel like coming to church, I don't come to church. If I don't feel like serving, I don't serve. But when I need you, you must turn up. And God said, try me and see. That's why you find many Christians fail. Live defeated life is because of this kind of a superstition. They think that God owes them something. They think that they can manipulate God. They think that by just coming to church, you know, God is going to say, ah, I owe you something. You came to church. Let me ask you something. If you are an employer, you hire some staff on the working day, right? Let's say Monday is a working day. Do you expect the staff to turn up? You should turn up, right? Because if not, you will give them the fried, the cuttlefish, right? right? Isn't it? But when they turn up, do you thank them and say, oh, so thankful you turn up. Thank you so much. Do you? You expect him to work. You expect her to work, right? Same thing. This is the kingdom of God. You are citizen of the kingdom. You are part of the kingdom. You are soldiers. You are warriors. You are expected to work in the kingdom. That's it. I am expected to work. Do you think that, oh, you see, you are the pastor. You are the pastor. Oh, Pastor Albert, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You think God is going to do that to me? No way. In fact, every day I say, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Why? It's a privilege. Do you see? And therefore, when people don't understand this and they have tumor, they have boys, they have all kinds of bad things happening to them. Why? It's because, you see, the heart is not right. And so these are enemies of God. And God say, all right, you want to capture me? I'll let you capture. But can you stand me? And so what happened? Seven months. Seven months of crisis. Seven months of defeat. Seven months of boys. Seven months of tumor. And so what happened was that they went to the diviners, they went to the shaman, and they went to their, their, their witch doctors and their bomo and said that, what should we do? Then 
They say, send the ark back because we cannot, you know, take all this onslaught because God, this God of Israel is very powerful, right? But how do we know that all these things are from this God? Maybe it's only by accident, you know? Maybe it's coincidence. So how do we know? Say, you can know. Get two milk cows. Put the ark onto the, the cart, all right? Put the milk cow, see where they go. Then you take your calf, all right, the baby cow, and you put it in the stall. You pen them up. Now the mother cow will want to go back to the baby cow, all right? But if the mother cow, they do not go back to the baby cow, it means that God was directing them. God is directing them. So can you see? Two milk cows, put the calf here, see where they go. If they turn around and say, moo, 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 my baby, my baby, then it's not from God. Means all these, you know, boys and all this tumor, not from God. Only accident only. Huh? That somehow there's a, a, a pubonic plague that come in. And so they place the ark of God, of the Lord, on the cart. And along with the chest, uh, along with the chest, you know why? Because the, the Bomo said, the Bomo said, ah, okay, you know you have offended this God. Now you must give some, you know, guilt offering. You must say, I'm sorry. Okay? So what you do, you see all the rats, right? You make golden rats, five of them, golden rats. And these five represent all the cities, yeah? And then five tumors, <laughs> golden one, huh? not the real tumor. Don't pluck off your tumor and put that. Go one. All right, and then put in a box and say, I am sorry. Okay, now if let's say this is really from God, then all the plague and all the crisis happen in your, con in your city will stop. So you say, well, good idea, good idea. They place that and then they let the cow, the cows go. Then the cow, as directed by the Holy Spirit, did not go back to the calf. The cow continued to move across to Israel and to the place called Beth Shemesh. Beth Shemesh was a place where the Levites stays. The Levites, right? Many of the Levites stay in that town and began to go there. And then it came to the field of Joshua, right? And there it stopped beside a large rock. God let them to stop and say, okay, this is the place. And so the Philistines were watching as far as they could see. Oh, yeah. The cows have crossed over. And then peace started to happen in their place. No more tumor. Because God has returned to the country of his choice. And then what the people did was that they chopped up the wood of the cart and they sacrificed the cows as burnt offering to the Lord. Which means that they didn't, you know, kill the cow and make into curry, all right? Beef curry. They offered it as a sacrifice on the Lord. Because God was in the picture all the time and the people knew, yes, we have to offer this to the Lord. And they did that. But what happened? Crisis happened. Because the God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. Now, did you know that the ark, not all Levites can even handle the ark. It's only the Kohagai, the people from the, the, the descendants of Kohat. All right, these were the Levites allowed to handle the ark. Not anybody can just touch the ark or look at the ark or, or people, you know, uh, let me take a look. And that's what happened. 70 of them tried to look inside the ark and then they all got killed. So before Uzzah, 70 people already died. And you never heard about this, right? Because let me tell you, is that these 70 died simply because it's a violation of the glory of God. I want you to know that many of us, we no longer fear God. And so the glory of God, we don't care. But I can tell you, the glory of God is still 
very powerful and don't mess with God. If you come to God, you bow. You come to God with full respect and full honor. You come in the house of God, you respect. You don't have your own style, your own way, you know, and then you, you treat this like a nightclub. No, this is the place whereby the people of God comes together. This is a place where Shekinah glory of God comes because all of you, what you did is that you bring the presence of God here and together we enjoy the presence of God. And so they, the people, actually, you know, those people from uh, Beth uh, Ashamesh, you know, they send word to the people in Kariat Jerim and say, come, 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 come and get the ark. Okay? And so what happened was that, so the man from that place came and took up the ark of the Lord. They brought it to Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated, here is a consecration, Eliezer. Eliezer is the elder son, right, of, of this Abinadab. And he said that to guard the ark of the Lord, which means that to take care of the ark. Okay? And then you find that uh, this Abinadab had two more sons. One of them is called Uzzah. Another one is called Ahio. Ahio, like Chinese name. Ahio. Uh, Ahio. Uh, A-H-I-O. Okay? Yeah. So these two other sons. Now, these people were what? These people were actually Levites. Yeah? But what happened here is that but they were not supposed to touch the heart, the heart because they were not from that tribe. Okay? They were not from that, that group. Uh, from the, they were not descendants of Kohat. And so, it was there for how long? Can you see? 20 years. You know why? Nobody cares about the heart. Everybody went on living Ask yourself a question. 20 years ago, did you care about God? 10 years ago, did you care about God? How about 10 days ago? How about 10 hours ago? Did you care about God? Many of us, I can tell you, we are busy with our own thing. We spend 90% of our time talking about our own life, our own thing. But only 10%, most probably we share the 10%. And out of that 10%, maybe 2% we talk about God. The rest, we talk about some other spiritual things. That's what happened when we, people say, how come the church, there's no revival? How come people are not spiritual? That's what happened. Because you become what you spend time with. If you spend time with the world, you become like the world. You talk like the world. You even have vulgar words like the world. You think like the world. Isn't that true? Watch the, the program that you watch. And those people who like to watch a very violent show, they are very violent people. Anything they oh, want to fight, want to fight, want to fight, want to fight, right? Very violent. Especially young kids, you know, when you play game, you play those violent games, you know, and ready, fight. Then in real life, anything, ready, fight. That's what happened. Then some of you here, you like to watch those very romantic, romantic, Movie until you fall in love with every man you meet. You got already got a husband. Oh, they are like child, they are so handsome. Oh, that one, that one so kind. Because you are so romantic until you don't know the direction of God in your life. That's why you see it's very important that you actually, when the when the ark returned to Israel, the the the, the leadership of Israel would have taken the ark back. But at that time, King Saul had no concern about the ark. He only would go to Ab um, this Abinadab house if he needs something from God. But apart from that, he had no plan to build a house or anything for God. So 20 years. So now King Saul was dead. And so King David became king. And so now King David said, okay, now I'm the king. I have authority, I have power. I'm coming for the ark. So they set the ark on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Ah, so I told you what David did, right? He did not ask the Lord. He just said, I think God is going to be happy. I'm going to bring the, the ark of God back to Jerusalem. What did he do? He put it on a cart. 
He followed the ways of the Philistine. He did not follow the way of God. The way of God was different. That God must rest upon the shoulder of man. That you must carry the presence of God on your shoulder. And God will not sit in your bullock cart, clack, 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 like that. All right? God will not sit. Not even your Avanza or whatever car that you have. God will not sit. God said, I must be carried. And what is that? That is a king. He is the king of kings. Because when you look at ancient painting, all the kings, whether Persian kings, Egyptian kings, you, you can go and check. Google it. All carried by men. Because they are higher than men. Carried on shoulder. And God said, I am even greater still. Got to be carried. But they put him on the cart. And so he said, okay, I'll see what you do. <laughs> so David thought that he was doing the right thing. And then you have Uzzah and Ahio, right, the, the Chinese boy, right, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. He was, I think he was like dragging the, he was holding on to uh, the oxen and then pulling them along, walking in front of it. And, but then what happened? Uh, okay, David, uh, David, you know, and all Israel were celebrating and they were uh, celebrating with all their might in front of the Lord, you know, and they were playing all these different instruments like the keyboard, la, la, the electric guitar, la, trumpet, la, drum, everything that they had. They brought it out and they celebrated. He thought that God would be happy. Was God happy? God was just waiting and said, okay, I want to see what you want to do. You're so smart. I say put on man's shoulder, you put me on the ox cart like the Philistine. Now, Philistine, they were not Israelites, so they didn't know. But you have the word of Moses. And Moses said, put it on the shoulder. How come you didn't do it? But the Lord kept very quiet. Now, let me tell you, the silence of God is dangerous. If God is not talking, be very careful. Because our God talks to us. Our God loves to communicate. Then one day when you pray and God is not talking, God is like, then you better <laughs> stop everything. And keep asking until you can hear his voice. Oh, God is not talking. Silent is consent. Therefore, we just keep doing. No, for God is not. If he's not talking, he's like, you know, very angry. <laughs> All right. Until no more voice already. How many of you are very angry with your children until you cannot scold anymore? <sighs> right. So God is just watching. When they came to the trashing floor of Nakon. Now, trashing floor, my friends, is supposed to be flat. It's a place where you used to trash the weeds and, you know, so it's a flat piece of cemented or flat piece of ground. Yeah? And then Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. How come on the flat piece of ground, the oxen stumbled? Because God was not happy. So God said in the, in the cut, and maybe the, the Lord was the one who shake a little bit, you know. And then the oxen was like, wow, this power, man. Right? And then Uzzah reached out and tried to help God. Oftentimes it's this way. We have this notion that the kingdom of God needs our help. And that, you know, without our help, the kingdom of God is going to perish especially when people who are very rich. You know, when they are rich, they come to the church, they give money to the church. And then when they get angry with the pastor, especially this pastor, they get angry with the pastor, they say, I'm going to leave the church. Oh, so they leave the church. Then they take away their money from the church, right? They say, I'm not going to tie to the church. I'm not going to bless the church with money. And you are going to be poor. <laughs> And then they have this idea. They have this idea. Some of them pass the word around there. Well, now we leave the church and we are the rich people. We are the tithers. And then uh, Faith Line is going to be poor. I say, excuse me? You think you are God? It is God who is the provider. Amen? Amen or not? God is your provider. 
And don't you, some of you are going to be pastors, don't you one day count out to the rich people because they bring in the money. They are not your provider. If God wants them to come, they must come. If God wants them to give their millions, they must. But if they refuse, then it's between them and God. There's nothing to do with you. But God will provide for you. And that's what God is. And so we, we think that we are going to help God. God is stumbling. You know, we are, we, are, we are going to help God. No, God said, I have no need. In fact, the Bible never said that, you know, after Uzziah died, then the whole ark would fall down from the cut. No. It wasn't because Uzziah helped God, but Uzziah actually violated God's rights. Ah, this verse, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7 says, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. God already said, number one, you have the word. I have given you instruction. This is electricity you cannot touch. That's it. This is power you cannot touch. This is glory you cannot touch. Only certain people can touch, but not you. You see? But you say, I don't care. You touch, you die. The consequence always, God is like that. No matter who you are, you can be Moses. God said, speak to the rock. I don't want to. He hit the rock. God says, speak to the rock. I never asked you to hit the rock. He said, I'm angry. Hit the rock. All right. Then you don't get to enter the promised land. That's it. You actually could have, can enter the promised land, but because of your disobedience. And so in every chapter, in every story, God was trying to tell us uh, or teach us lessons. For those of us here, God wants to bless us, but we don't know how to receive the blessing because we continually retaliate and come against the will of God. God said, don't do it. Speak, only speak to the rock. Don't hit it. We hit it. Why you hit it? I'm Moses. Uh. I took the people out of Egypt. You know. I, God said, so? I am the one who helped you. So you are not the Lord. I am the Lord. Now, you are being, you know, restricted from going into the promised land. Now, some of you say, wow, God is so nasty. God is actually very merciful because, because later on, Moses entered the promised land. Right? You remember? When during the transfiguration of Jesus, remember? When Jesus was on the mountain and he was transfigured, who appeared next to him? Moses and Elijah. And where was Moses? In the promised land. <laughs> you see? So God, sometimes he can be very nasty, but then he gives you some chance. Your Hokkien say pang chan, pang chan, means give you some chance. Some chances so that, you know, because of your effort, he bless you. So ultimately, Moses was blessed because he appeared with the Savior. Moses didn't understand about the Savior until he went to heaven. And then the Lord said, I will send my begotten son. And then you find that when Moses appeared, he would, you know, here is the Savior, the Messiah, and here is the law. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. So the law and prophet, Jesus fulfilled them both. And so all this go behind him. And what you see, you see Jesus. Therefore, you no longer celebrate all this Israeli festival. The Jewish festival, you no longer do it. All right? Behind Jesus. Everything is Jesus. Therefore, you find that the Lord says that Jesus, he was the first fruit and that on the Sunday, he rose again. And therefore, you find that the feast of first fruit was on a Sunday. And that's why Jesus said that we worship him on Sunday. Sunday we are here. Some people still want to worship him on Saturday. No, Saturday is when the Lord's rest. 
But then Sunday is where the resurrection of Jesus. And then on the day of Pentecost, same thing. It was like on a Sunday, right? And so the Holy Spirit was given. And therefore, Sunday to us became very important. But some people said, I don't care. I don't care what the new thing that the Lord said, I want to follow after the old way. But God said, there is a new thing. For, for example, I, I read this article about this man said, this brother said, you know, we must worship God on a mountain. Because why? Because all the, you know, all the pagans, uh, uh, the temple, uh, they all built on the mountain, you know. They put flags and all that. So the churches must be on a mountain because God is God of the mountain. I said, huh, where did you read that? You see, in antiquity, they said that God is the God of the mountain. Therefore, when you fight the people of Israel, we must fight, him in, fight them in the plain, in the valley. Right? And then God appeared in the valley and they lost. <laughs> right? The children of Israel won. How come? Because God is both on the mountain and on the plain and in the valley. He is God of everywhere. And now we are going back again to the traditional Chinese idea. Oh, this mountain, we must have one temple. That mountain, we must have one temple. So we control all the mountains. But no. Jesus said, in the last days, people shall worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? So there's no more. Because the Samaritan, the Samaritan woman said that, Oh, you know, our forefather worshipped here. And then you all worship there. And Jesus said, In the last days, it will be the heart. It will be the worship in spirit and in truth. So you see what happened here is that when we get into the word of God, then we fully understand the word of God and what God really wants us uh, to do. So the Kohatites, the Kohatites were assigned to handle the Ark of the Covenant. And they were one of the four main divisions among the Levites. So you got the Gershonites, the Mararites, and the Aaronites. So only the Kohatites are the people who carry the Ark. And so you find that Uzzah was not. And Uzzah violated the glory of God. Uzzah violated the Lord of God. And Uzzah took things into his own hand. He wanted to help God. And God said, I'll take you to heaven first. All right? So Uzzah went straight to be with him. Now, the Bible says, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 8, David was angry because the Lord wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez. Uzzah means burst out against Uzzah. And David was angry. In fact, David was angry with himself. David was angry with God. Why did God do it? Yeah? And then David was afraid. He said, now, David was afraid of the Lord and that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He became doubtful. And that's what happened here. When tragic things happened, he was celebrating and suddenly, God put a full stop. God said, wait, you have not done it my way. It's not going to be like that. And Uzzah died. Then, he became upset. He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittites. So now, he put it into somebody's house. Now, this Oba, uh, this Obey Edom, Obey Edom is servant of Edom. He was a Levite. But because he used to stay in the city of God before, and so they called him the Gittites. But actually, he was a Jew because in other portion, it tells you that he was a Levite. And that makes sense. Because the Levites, only the Levites will look after the ark, right? And so... What the Bible says, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obey, Edom, the Gittites, for how many, how long? Three months. And during these three months, the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Do you know why the Lord blessed Obey, Edom? It's because he showed respect. He showed honor. He showed fear. He honor. He would not just go and peep at the ark and be very curious and do all kinds of silly things. But 
he stay away because of the glory of God, but he honor. And there was some uh, painting where it showed that Obey Edom actually bow before God every day, every day, bow before the ark. And so three months, God blessed him. Uh, his harvest was good. Whatever that he did was good. And everything multiplied by a hundredfold. He can have, you know, he can have oil. And then the oil never seems to cease. And so the word was spread out and said that God was blessing or God is blessing this household. And so David was told, and the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has before of the ark of God. Now here, the word is everything that he has. Did you know that when you start to honor God and you start to bless God, your children get blessed. Everything that you have. Your business, God got blessed. Anything that you own, God bless. Even your car, God bless. Let's break down. Some of you got break down every week. Right? Yeah. Ours is like once a, once a year. <laughs> uh, uh, this year, no. <laughs> Praise God. Some of you say touch wood, touch wood. That one is superstition. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me tell you here. Okay. Blessing. I tell you, when the presence of Jesus is in your house, there's blessing. When the presence of Jesus is in your life, there's blessing. That's why every day I seek the presence. You say, oh, Jesus is already with you. Yes, I know. He's with me. But do I sense Him? Do I honor Him? Do I treasure Him? Do I worship Him? I got to do my part. Oh, I don't care. Who cares about Jesus? You know, I'm so busy. I got to cook breakfast. I got to go feed the dog. I got to take care of everything. Who cares about Jesus? No, I care. Even when I minister to my dog, I had one dog who is, uh, you know, she is very old now and she's dying of cancer. But she's not dying. And she's in no pain. Why? Because every day I lay hands on her and say, be healed in the name of Jesus. All pain be gone. And she's so skinny. She ate a lot. And she pooped a lot. But she could walk around, still move around. So my Jesus is everywhere. He's with me in the house. He's with me with my pet. He's with me in my, in my work as I prepare sermon and as I counsel. Whatever that I'm doing, Jesus is there. Can you see? That's what blessing is all about. And then it's up to you. Some of you are, say, I don't need, oh, then it's, it's your choice. But I am not like that. I want the blessing. And so now David, he tried again. He said, okay, I am going to do it God's way. All right. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obey Edom to the city of David with what? Rejoicing. He said, I'm not, I'm going to forget about the past bad experience. I am going to keep honoring my God and I'm going to do it my, uh, not my way, His way. My way is the wrong way. Okay, so what he did was that he got the priest to come and they carried the ark. And then every six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. And you just see the sacrifice right there. Every six steps. You know, how, how far was this place from the city of uh, David? Ten miles. Ten miles. And for ten miles, every six step, he sacrificed. So you're talking about thousands and thousands of bulls and fattened calf he sacrificed. And he gave it, you know, as a peace offering. He gave it as, you know, uh, an offering of appreciation, Yeah. Then wearing a linen ephod, right? David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. While he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and sound of trumpets. Now some painting you will see that he wear this ephod. But there is another portion that says that he gird himself. Gird means that he wear like a pampas, yeah? He gird himself. With the ephod, means he didn't wear, he didn't tie over at the shoulder here. He allowed it to drop, and then he 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 wear it like the the way you know the Indian and the Malay they wear the sarong, and then they pull up, and then they tie out like that. And so he caused that that shirt that uh, that 
this ephod tray to come down and tie. And what did he do? He began to dance. Down here, when we worship God, some of you don't even move. You stand here like statue like that. And we worship you. Then you raise one finger. Worship you. I said, raise your hand. Cannot. Only can raise one finger. But some of you are waving your hand. Ah, you are like David. If your heart is like David, you will show. Okay? You will show. Right? So, he began to dance. But as he came near to the city of David, he entered the city of David. Michal, the daughter of Saul, his first wife, watched from a window. A very unhappy observer. And then, when she saw the king, when she saw King David, you know, leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Let me tell you that this can happen to you. Every time you worship the Lord, somebody in your family actually despises you. Okay? I had this experience before when I worshiped God and my mother would utter beneath her breath and say, fanatic. You know, fanatic. Right? Because I'm worshiping God. I worship God. I worship God. Right? You are a fanatic. But later on, when she got saved, she worshiped God. All right? So I should say fanatic. <laughs> yeah. But so she despised him in her heart. And then they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. Now, you can see the picture. It's just a very simple tent. It wasn't the tabernacle, right? This is called the tabernacle of David. Something different about this place is not because of the how wonderfully designed that uh, it was, but it was worship. It was a 24-7 worship that David insisted all the Levites would take turn and they will sing to the Lord 24-7. They will worship and so, when you come near to the tabernacle of David, you will hear what? Worship. You'll hear a song. And I worship you. So you hear that. Wonderful. And that is what should be. Because 24-7, at any time, your heart, there's a temple of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And if that temple of the Holy Spirit is filled with worship, how pleased God is. That's why the tabernacle of David that God will re-establish because God is saying that in your tabernacle, let there be worship. And then when he had finished sacrificing the burnt offering and fellowship offering, burnt offering is that to sacrifice for all his mistake and all his sin. And then fellowship offering is to say, God, let's be friends. Huh? Let's be friends. Don't be angry with me. All right. And then he blessed the people. Why? Because this is a God of the people. This is not just his God. This is a God of the people. So he blessed them in the name of the Lord. He's going to bless them. And then what he did, he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of date, and the cake of raisin to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their home. Why he gave that? He gave them this uh, bread. You know, Jesus called himself the bread of life. Then he gave the cake of date. And this is the place that is to tell you that it is fatal. All right? And that this, this, this place is beautiful. And so raisin, that is, is uh, the wine that's, that's flowing. All right? So all these are symbolic meaning that God, he is the provider. He, gave, he provided us with the promised land. He provided us with the food. He provided us with the cattle and the sheep and everything there is, all right, that we must give thanks. And so he, he blessed the people. And then the people, when they brought back the food, right, they brought back, you know, what did they bring back? The take-home value is a memory because they say, ah, as they begin to eat the raisin cake, because they can't eat it all in one day, right? They've got to eat like one whole week. And so as they eat the raisin cake, they are thinking of oh, the Lord has come into the city of David. As they began to eat the, uh, the, the cake of dates, you know, they began to think of the presence of God. You see, so what David did was that he even blessed the people, not just with the produce, 
but with a memory. Sometimes you need to create memory for your family. Why we celebrate Christmas, why we have Easter and all that, creating memories. Some people say, oh, Easter, Easter, I, I don't come. Easter, I go holiday. No memory, holiday only. Uh, but Easter, when you come here and then you, you, you enjoy with all the brothers and sisters and experience how the resurrection of the Lord you know, being translated into words and put into drama and put on the screen for you and that all the sound, sight and the smell, and all this, you create a memory. Especially small kids, they need memories. I met a young man. He backslided. He came back to church. And why did he come back? Because when he was young, he attended Sunday school. And then he remembered all the Christmas, or the Easter, or the festivals. He remembered them. And they give him good memories. And now he has grown old, uh, older and he experienced a lot of hardship outside. A lot of sadness, a lot of grief. And he longed to get back to the purity of those memories. See, you can create memories for your children and grandchildren. So when David re returned home to bless his household, he... Remember his household, right? He wanted to bless them. Michal, daughter of Saul, came out and met him and said, so now you see words of disappointment because David was dancing like that, yeah? Yeah. How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servant as any vulgar fellow would. She was a princess, right? And now she... Is the wife of David, a queen. And she said, you are like any vulgar fellow. Means those unkempt, those people who are not civilized. But did you know that for many years, David actually worked among these people? They were known as bandits. Right? Those years when they were running from from King Saul, these were the people who protected him. And so now this girl, in a, uh, this, this wife, in, in a few short phrase, began to insult not just him, but his people who protected him all those years before he became king. And then he says that you are half naked because he was wearing that diaper. Half naked. And then he said, in the full view of the slave girls. So what she was trying to say is that even the slave girl looked down on you. You're the king, right? The slave girl looked down on you. Because the way you behave. And David said, <laughs> I love David. David is a wonderful guy. It was before the Lord who chose me. David said, it was before the Lord. The Lord who chose me rather than your father. Wow, this is, you know, because the father was King Saul, right? See, not your father who chose me, okay? Your father wanted to kill me. But to be fair to Michal, right? She was the one who protected David a lot of time. She was the one who personally let David, you know, out of the window to escape being killed. So she loved him. But somehow her love has been misplaced, you know why? Because she didn't love God first. She loved the man and she wants him to be dignified. But she didn't love God first. But David said, I love God first. So what he says is that even your father rejected me, but God placed me. And then anyone from his household, they all rejected me. But God appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. He said, I will celebrate before the Lord. What he was saying is that no matter what your thing, my God is number one. I will celebrate. And I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. What he was saying is that even if I were to be naked and celebrating before the Lord, and if that is required, I will do it. Now I wear this diaper and then you are scolding me. But if God say, strip naked, I will do it. Guess who did it? 
there was a person by the name of Jesus Christ. He did it naked. When he died on the cross, the painter and the artist actually paint a cloth over him. But the Roman, you know, their crucifixion, that all the criminals there would be crucified naked. And so if you have all the shame, if you have your nakedness, nakedness being exposed, and you are having this terrible thought, remember, one person did it for you. Jesus Christ, he died. That's why when David echoed this, when he said that, I will even be more undignified. The son of God who became the son of man became undignified for you and for me. And how can we don't thank him? If we don't thank him, it means that we, our heart must be heart of stone and that we must be so ungrateful. When he pulled us from the depth of hell and put us into heaven and we don't even say a word of thanks, and then even coming to church is so difficult. Serving God is so difficult. Everything is so difficult. And here he was naked, died on the cross, shed his blood so that you don't have to go to hell. He pulled you and all the way to heaven. I am blessed. And I must remember. And so he said that I will be humiliated in my own eyes. He said, but for these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. He, you say these slave girls, the lowest of them, are they, they were the ones who were going to look down on me. Wrong. These slave girls are much better than you. Because these slave girls, they knew my heart. They knew that I was worshipping God. They knew my background. They will hold me in honor. But not you. You are the queen. But you cannot even see past the slave girl. So can you see how this is being done? Is that Sunny Mikhail, because of her own self-interest, even her desire was for her husband to be dignified, but because of her own self-interest, she somehow had put God last and not God first. And so the Bible says, and Mikhail, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Now, we are not talking about barrenness being a judgment, but certain barren, barrenness would be a judgment, right? Like some sickness are not judgment. Some sickness are. So what we are saying to you here is that in this case, Mikhail was punished and that forever she would bear no children for David, right? Be Imagine you can be the ancestor of David's uh, descendant. Isn't that great? But she was not counted as one of them. How many of you will say that I really appreciate Jesus for being undignified for me? And I want to give thanks. Just raise your hand to him. Just raise your hand. Yeah. He's worthy. Raise your hand to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.